There are certain goods that would not exist in the universe if there were not the possibility of suffering. You can think about the supernatural virtues, hope. Well, what would it mean in a universe to hope for something if your universe had everything? Welcome to Purposeful Lab, a Magic Center podcast. I'm Katherine Hedro with Dr. Dan Keebler. And Dan, you had this great interview with Dr. Christopher Baglow for today's episode. Give us a preview of what's ahead. Yeah, so Dr. Baglow is uh, a theologian, and we talked, you know, this season about evolution. One of the questions that always comes up in relation to this is the problem of human evil and uh, mm-hmm. human suffering, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and we look at this from sort of two perspectives. Why is there you know, um, suffering in the natural world in the sense that the humans are susceptible to tsunamis and earthquakes, you know, what, what's, how do you make sense of that with a purposeful God and a loving Mm -hmm. God, right? And then also just a question of human evil, you know, the human suffering at the hands of other humans. Uh, Yeah. Mm -hmm. Those are, those are deep questions, you know, how do you, um, you know, uh, make sense of a all loving God when there is such evil, um, that, uh, and, and suffering Mm -hmm. that you find in the world. So, um, and he's 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 written a lot about this and mm-hmm. uh, talked a lot about it. So it's it's it was great to have that discussion with him. You know, these are big questions you grapple with any time the topic of evolution, you bring in Genesis, just these questions of the fallen nature of humans. So this is an important one for this season. And just uh, Dr. Chris Baglow was in an earlier season. We had a shorter interview with him, but just so our viewers are aware, Dr. Christopher Baglow leads the Science and Religion Initiative over at the University of Notre Dame's McGrath Institute for Church Life. And he presents on numerous topics at this intersection of faith and science. Um, He's the author of Faith, Science, and Reason, Theology on the Cutting Edge and Creation. And he's also the author of A Catholic's Guide to God and the Universe. Um, You know him also in his capacity as the theological advisor to the board of directors for the Society of Catholic Scientists, of which you are the vice president. Yeah, so I've known him for uh, a number of years. He's a um, a great uh, um, thinker and very mm-hmm. um, articulate about uh, these issues. You know that that first book you mentioned, you know, Science mm-hmm. and Reason. That's a, a nice textbook, it's like a high school textbook that uh, covers science and and faith issues. Sort of got groundbreaking because there really wasn't anything there if a high school teacher wanted to talk about mm-hmm. these issues. And then the second one, A Catholic's Guide to God and mm-hmm. um, uh, a Creation, that that one is, uh, I think, very, very accessible to uh, a general audience. That's good to hear. Well, thanks for traveling to South Bend for us to get this interview. And with that, here's Dan's conversation with Dr. Christopher Baglow. Well, Chris, it's great to have you back on the, the podcast. We had you on briefly uh, before when you, we were um, at the Society of Catholic Scientists meeting. So um, so our viewers got to uh, know a little bit about you, but uh, for those that haven't uh, seen that episode or are unfamiliar with you, you know, it would be great to just uh, to start a little bit about your your background. You know, you, you uh, work here at Notre Dame at the uh, in McGrath uh, Institute for Church Life. Um, you're a theologian, and uh, you've uh, got into um, a lot of work in the science and faith area. And so maybe you can just tell us how you got into that. Um, it's a very interesting story. Uh, yeah, from my sure. Um, I think that would help. Well, I mean, I was uh, I was actually uh, half te- half professor, half administrator when I got into this work, and Hurricane Katrina disrupted my career, for um, and also my my domestic situation. My my house was flooded by Katrina um, at a time when uh, I was not sure where I was going to be going or what I'd be doing. I was approached by the president of McGill Tulin Catholic High School in Mobile, Alabama to create a curriculum on faith and science for his school, a project I said yes to somewhat foolishly because at the time it was not an area I really knew very well and also because I was assuming that the college where I worked would never open again, um, which was the rumor on the street. Turned out that rumor was unfounded. But I ended up spending the next two years writing a curriculum which became a textbook. From there, I realized that the key work would not just be um, in text, but also in in people. And so I started working with Catholic high school science and religion teachers. And that's really, I think, the context in which our work has kind of come together and the things that you and I do for the Science and Religion Initiative here at Notre Dame. But that work ultimately led me here. Yeah, it's interesting. You have a really broad outreach here at yeah. the Science and Religion um, uh, initiative. Um, and, and we do, uh, 
a lot of work uh, across the country where you get to talk to a lot of high school educators, and students, and so forth. So I just, you know, based on that experience, what would you say, like, what is the biggest misconception or issue that people have in terms of, you know, um, integrating science and their Catholic faith? What is the, you know, if you had to say there's one thing that really, um, you know, is, is the most important thing to get across to, to people or they struggle with the most? Is there something like a philosophical thing or is there a scientific issue or, you know, in, in your experience of the feedback that you get uh, across the country? Believe it or not, well, actually, you would believe it because you see it all the time. Um, the misconception that faith and science are at odds with each other, at least the Catholic faith and modern science are at odds, is like a straw man. And it's easy to push over. Yeah. You know, you, you give them a... You, know, you scratch the surface right, and it disappears. Right, right. <laughs> it just disappears. I mean, uh, our friend Corey Hayes gives us Galileo lecture. We talk about Father George Lemet, the founder of the Big Bang Theory, who's a Catholic priest. We talk about the Catholic almost saint now, Blessed Nicholas Steno, who discovered the geology necessary to discover the ancient age of the earth, which made Darwin's work possible. And people begin to realize that that a lot of their questions were answered before they ever arose. Right. Then it becomes, I think, the real thing and the exciting thing about the work that we get to do together is that we get to then show them how to think about the faith through a modern scientific lens. You know what I mean? And that puts them in a position where with young people who, you know, STEM is everywhere now, STEM programs are everywhere now, with the young people that they meet, that's the way they're going to see the faith if they're going to see it at all. So once you begin to do that, though, it's very exciting how those young people themselves respond, how their teachers are able now to meet their needs and help them find Christ in a way that they never thought possible maybe when they began their careers. Yeah, no, I think it's really nice, the, the physical embodiment of a, of, of a theologian and a scientist, yes. and, you know, and it's not just you and me, but other theologians, Absolutely. other scientists at the meeting where they look and say, oh, wow, this actually works. Yes. These people are talking to each other. They're actually engaged with, both disciplines are engaged with each other. And they say, oh, there, there's a right. natural. And, and the comfort, confidence, and openness that that radiates to them just tells them that the, the conflict thesis is, is a misconception. It's a lie. And then from there, it's just a matter of continuing to, you know, um, help them begin to answer the individual questions. So I would say the misconception, the biggest problem is the easiest one to solve. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's good. Yeah. Now, the, these you know, individual questions can be very, very, very tricky, right? Yeah. And, and, and I just want to point out your book, which I, we're going to be talking today, particularly about, you know, the question of evil in, right. in the world. And so this book, Creation, A Catholic's Guide to, to God and the Universe, is a chapter in here we're going to sort of focus on. This is a great book, a great resource for people that are interested in these issues that Thank we're going to be talking about yeah. um, uh, today. Um, you know, because this book talks about, it, it's interesting to me because it, it discusses a lot about evolution and the problem of evil. And it, to me, they're, they're, they're often interconnected and they seem to be the two biggest um, issues that people struggle with and sort of integrate. And you go, you, you dive into both of them in this book. You take out the two oh, sort yeah, of yeah, absolutely. hardest, hardest um, uh, questions. How do you see those two, uh, do you see those as interrelated or just sort of two separate questions? Or do they one flow into the other? They're deeply related to each yeah. other. But the one question, the problem of evil, is obviously a question that people have been thinking about for a lot longer than that intersection of evolution and evil. And, they, and the fact that Death is intrinsic to the unfolding of the world as we know it. That suffering is something that is uh, almost omnipresent throughout creation. Right. Yeah. Um, the 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 way I approach it in the book is I start by speaking quite be uh, optimistically. I don't know beautifully, tried, but quite optimistically and enthusiastically about the Christian doctrine of creation, which boils down to. God is love, and God creates the world and love. I, I think that's the hardest thing to reconcile with the problem of evil. Yeah, no, I think so. So that's why that's chapter two. Okay. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you start there. You know, right, right. Yeah, yeah. Like, and, and a lot of people is like, okay, yeah, we can roll with this, but it remains a fiction until they can begin to reconcile that with their own experience, which is saturated with pain. Right. No, I, and that's, I think, I think people... 
you know, they struggle with evolution sort of in the background. It's yeah. sort of an intellectual, ah, well, I don't bump into evolution every day in terms of, you know, I struggle, right. but I bump into pain and suffering every day, yes. right? And so it, th that becomes even more yeah. um, uh, difficult for them to come yeah, over because right. they're experiencing it directly, right. whereas evolution is more of a uh, and what intellectual evolution question. evolution tells them is what seems like the bad news which is that their own personal experience is writ large across the entire history of life. Right. I mean, you know what I mean? That's true. It's yeah, like, okay, yeah, go yeah, yeah, yeah. You're, you're having a hard time. You're, you know what I mean? With, uh, with uh, some physical malady that is making it difficult for you to flourish or feel happy because of the pain you're experiencing. Maybe it's a bad back. Maybe it's something worse like cancer. You know, whatever it might be. Maybe it's a disability you were born with. Whatever that might be. Um, that's the universe, or at least that's the living universe. The living universe has that all over the place. So it's almost as if your own place where you secretly wonder, is there a God, gets this massive stamp from evolutionary science that says, yeah, that's a good doubt to have. And that's where people see, that's really where they kind of struggle with it. You know? yeah. yeah, right. No, exactly. Now, um, it's interesting of your story, right? The, you, we're going to talk about like sort of natural evil and morally. We make yeah. that distinction in the book, but like a natural evil being like a cancer or a hurricane right. and things like that. That your story is <laughs> influenced by natural evil or brought you into the science of man. Like it's kind of interesting. There. Yeah, yeah. But um, so the the whole evolutionary process, right, is is full, chock full of sort of natural evils, and then uh, yeah. uh, our ex human experiences, you right. know, cancer and things. You know, wildfires and, and, and earthquakes that cause death and, and destruction. Right? right. So, how do you um, it, it, it look at that from the perspective of a loving and good, all loving God who allows that to happen? How how, how does that? Uh, how do you start to piece those two together? Well, that that's the difficult part because it seems to me that the deepest meaning of suffering, the deepest meaning of of evil can only be discovered in a sense or is only answerable outside the universe. Like if that's what's, if, if the universe, we think about the universe as a system, right? Um, the meaning of any system really lies outside of it. So, so think, about, think about the rules of professional football as a system. Well, what it means to its fans and all that, it's not contained in that book. It might make a reference to it here or there, but they're not really going to capture the, the, the uh, sense of triumph or the sense of loss that occurs when your favorite team loses to the Atlanta Falcons. You know what I mean? They're, they're, not, they're not going, which happened yesterday for me, they're not going to be able to capture that because the meaning of the system lies outside the system. If that's true, then the meaning of both the joys, the sufferings, the incredible good that we see and beauty, but also the privation of goodness and beauty that we see, the ultimate meaning of that has to lie outside of the universe itself. It has to be in the God who created it. And co consistent with that is, is that we can only know it. We can only know the full meaning of it piecemeal. You know what I mean? And signs that and so, for instance, I think about the fact that I'm at the University of Notre Dame and I'm sitting here and talking with you, and this is a wonderful experience, but I wouldn't have had it if I hadn't been a Katrina refugee. Right. Okay. Yeah. So now I can look at that and I can begin to say, maybe then even more, much more horrible sufferings. I mean, my, mine was a first world suffering. I had a house with, I mean, I had a, a place thanks to my, my son's godfather. I had a place to be with my family. Yeah, it was just one room, and there was four of us living in that room. But we had air conditioning, and, and, and we had FEMA money where we could go buy ourselves some food. Or we could just eat in the rectory. You know, we, we had that. But the real sufferings, I mean, the horrifying sufferings that people go through, I, there's no way I could ever stand forth to somebody and say, I have an answer for you. I mean, but I can walk with them in their suffering with a certain confidence that there is an answer that lies on the God of love who causes and creates the whole universe, causes it to exist. And that, of course, the greatest sign of that is that he didn't stand outside of it. He became one of us. He became one of us, and in his becoming one of us, he took that suffering on. He drank it to its dregs. Right. He didn't yeah. leave a drop of it. 
you know, un, unswallowed um, so that he could be with us in the midst of it and bring us on the path towards meaning. Yeah, there seems to be something to the cent- center of creation. This is this cruciform nature of, of yeah. creation. That, that, that's the central um, event, you right. know, in, in it that, that we um, shouldn't expect that, that creation to be uh, apart from that. That, yeah. that, that, that's part and parcel of, of right. creation. There's something, and I always struck me about, you know, there's something about being a material, the material world, uh, you know, uh, it, 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 it's subject to de- death and decay, you know, right. so, so I'm being corrupted at this moment. I'm in right. the sense yeah. that I'm getting older as yeah, I talk yeah. to you. Know, right. Getting right. Grayer yeah, yeah. as I sit here. Like there's something You're about- disintegrating as we speak. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah, Hopefully, yeah, um, yeah I, I maintain upright posture. Yeah, right, right. Right. <laughs> but but the, the, there is um, something innate about just the fact that we're uh, f- you know, physical uh, beings yeah. and we're part of a material world that, that, that we are not- um, uh, uh, the perfection isn't here. We're good, but there isn't this perfection yeah. that we have, and that w- we are uh, subject uh, to that. So, is there something? Does that is that seem like limiting God in in in, in a sense, or does that speak to, to something about the fact that we are uh, that as a material world, we're not perfect, right? Right, we, right. Something, and, and that like, we are subjected to yeah. the these these. The, vis- the, the, yeah. the 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 natural evils of the of the world around us. Right. right. Well, I mean, uh, the Catechism actually answers this question. The Catechism of the Catholic Church, the one that uh, John Paul II produced for right. the Church uh, back in the 1990s. It, it, he says, um, with infinite wisdom and power, God could have created something better, namely than this universe. Um, but in his wisdom, he chose to create it in a state of journeying towards its ultimate perfection. So let's think about journeying towards ultimate perfection for a second. And we all know that there are certain goods that would not exist in the universe if there were not the possibility of suffering, if that was not really there. So um, think about, for instance, uh, um, the patience involved and the risk involved in childbirth um, for our species. I mean, that's, you know, uh, but also then the sufferings of parents as they care for children, as they deal with both their sorrows, if they, as they learn patience. I mean, what would patience mean or courage mean in a universe that had no possibility of evil? Yeah, right. There would simply be no such virtues. I mean, how, how, would, how, would, how would they be there? So all virtue, in the sense, is, is, is dependent it's, upon. Yeah. I mean, it seems to me, I mean, I can't think of a single one that doesn't, like, like think about the supernatural virtues, hope. Well, what would it mean in a universe to hope for something if your universe had everything? You know, or, um, or love, willing the good of the other for another's sake. Well, if the other has all their good, how do you will that? I mean, they already have it. Right, right. You can't participate in it. In other words, a universe journeying towards a state of perfection is a universe in which creatures in the image of God, who are capable of truth and love, can actually be agents of the perfection of that universe and share in the process of making it perfect with God. Right? Although we'll never get it all the way there, we'll all each have a small role to play in that process. Yeah, yeah. No, there's something about coming out of yourself, which is part and parcel of yep. the, the the cruciform world that God coming out of Him, right? The, the, coming to to meet humanity on our terms, how we're called to do that. And and, and you think about it, you want that for like yeah. we're both parents. You want that for your kids. You, you what you want is for them to come out of themselves. Yes. And and a lot of times it's suffering that brings them out of themselves, <laughs> right. where they like, okay, I'm going to lay down my life for my spouse or my yeah. kids, you know, and something. And you see them right grow in virtue. And right. It doesn't seem you, know, you said that that you know you I, can grow in virtue without um, uh, the the suffering that right. that but that you have to overcome. Right. right. I mean, I think about, for instance, the, the simple task that I have my kids do. Like, um, one son must empty the dishwasher. That's the youngest one. Okay. Um, he's not yet really tall enough to kind of handle scrubbing the dishes, and I don't trust him <laughs> to get them clean enough to put into the dishwasher. You know, you have to have that pre-washing right. thing. And the other one, my 17-year-old son, washes the dishes. Now, if I do not say 
empty the dishwasher, William, and then say, Peter, wash the dishes. They don't do it. And never have I come and found them at the process without me having said it. Right. <laughs> um, maybe two or three or four times. And at a certain point, you're like, you know, William, he had a really hard day at school today. And, you know, um, he's got a lot of homework. Should I really make him empty the dishwasher? And I'll think the same thing with Peter, you know. But the thing is, is that by giving them the opportunity to do that and all the other things they have to do, I'm helping them slowly move. I'm translating them out of my care and making them caring agents in the world that they inhabit. And those great times are the moments when you see them in that world, the little bit you get to see them as they're growing up, and they begin spontaneously doing the things that you have to constantly, you know what I mean, goad them into doing at home. Right. You know, <laughs> those are the moments. Yeah. And you realize, okay, hey, maybe I actually didn't entirely fail. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's hope. Right, there's hope. Well, I mean, if God is our father, right, and he is, um, and Jesus is our brother, right, uh, and he is, then we can see then in the world ever more opportunities to creatively respond to the need to that evil creates and to generate new goods from it. Yeah, now there is that, you, you can see that good can be generated from that, but at the same time you have people you know, the, that will say, like, well, God could have created any, like you know, the quote from John Paul too, God yeah. it could have created any, any possible right. world. This is not the best of all possible worlds. Right. So therefore God doesn't exist. Yeah. And, and so, the, yeah. and they're coming with this perspective and saying like, this is not the best of all possible worlds. So right. how, how can we even judge that? And well, I mean, well, that's what I think part of the problem is it's like, I would have to be outside the world to judge that. How inside the world am I supposed to come to that conclusion? And I don't know how I could talk about a best world because every time I try to uh, step outside of the world, I'm actually trying to get above the very source of my existence, which is the world. Yeah. So, you know, I, I don't think, I don't know if that's the path. I don't think that's the path. Yeah. Another path, um, which in a sense we're treading right now because we have to because we're on camera and we're asking questions about things. But it seems to me that people try to answer abstractly with, as a question the existential spirit experience of those who suffer. Uh, so seeing it and then, and this is, of course, the, the, this is the great, um, the great error of Job's friends. So in the book of Job, Job, of course, is divested of everything, right? And his friends show up. And they start telling him, well, you know, you must have done something, Job. You know, what was it? Because we can put together the formula for you to understand your suffering in words. And that's not the answer to suffering. The answer to suffering is compassion. The answer to suffering is to embrace someone or stand next to someone or to say with them, I'm angry at God, too, that this is happening to you, which, by the way, I think is one of the most important ways to respond to one's personal suffering and anguish is to tell God that, I mean, just like Job did. Right. You know what I mean? At the end of the book of Job, it's very interesting that after God gives this long speech to Job and Job says, now I have seen him. He doesn't say, now I have heard his answer. He says, now I have seen him and I repent in dust and, and ashes. Actually, God tells Job's friends that they're the ones who have been speaking incorrectly about God, and they should offer sacrifices. Right? Not Job. Yeah. Job, <clears throat> you have spoken. <clears throat> you have accused my servant, Job, um, and he has spoken rightly about me. This is what God's around about what God says, right? So there you have the, the answer. It's like Job wants an answer from God. He will not settle for any answer but the answer that God gives him. And Job's right, because we can't get to the answer on our own. Yeah, and th th in that story, there's a, a, that humility that comes through where God's saying, you weren't there at the foundation right. of the world. You weren't there. There's something about, you don't know what's good for you, <laughs> why, <laughs> what you need, in a sense. Exactly. And I think we think we know, I know what I need. I right. need a beach house, and I need yeah. a, a longer vacation. And this, this, right. <laughs> right. 
Um, but do we know what we need? It, particularly, like you said, if 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 um, the point of this is from outside the universe, the point of our existence, the meaning yeah. and so forth, is from outside of what we can control here. That right. that we we don't really right know, and we have to have God reveal it. Right. And he does, right? I mean, that's exactly what Christianity is about. The crucif- the crucified one is the re- revelation of what this is all about and his resurrection, right? Those two things together. Um, Eleanor Stump, who is the great, uh, great ca- Catholic philosopher at St. Louis University, and her book called Wandering in Darkness, which is about the problem of evil, um, she notes in God's speech, it's not just about telling Job there's no way you could understand this, even if I tried to tell you. It's the images that God gives of himself that are kind of answering Job at the same time. So it says that God swaddles the sea like a mother holding a, an unruly infant. You know how they do that? Like, one leg sticking out here and hands are good. You know what I mean? He swaddles the sea. Uh, uh, he speaks to Leviathan in gentle words, I think, is one of the, another example. All, there are all of these. Um, when God, you know, creates the firmament, the sons of God are there and shout with him for joy. All of these paternal, maternal images of God, as he tells Job, you can't understand. He's also telling Job, I'm caring for you, right? This is all about me caring for you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and so we focus so far, like, on these these physical evils, but when you get to, like, the moral evil, like, the evil that... you, you and I, the, the human heart is capable of, right? Yeah. Those seem to be, um, uh, people have even often have a more difficult time struggling with those because it's often very personal. They've been sure. wounded by a father. They've been wounded by, you know, uh, you know, someone around them violently. Right. right. And so, um, those seem to be what, uh, the things that people struggle with the most in terms of pulling out of where is God in this moment, you know, right. you know like where is God in a brutal rape or human trafficking and things right. like where is, why is God allowing, this is, this is like Job crying out, like why, where is God in this moment? Right. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, what, how do you address that? Sure. Okay, right. Well, let's recall that what happened in New Orleans during Katrina I mean, Katrina hit the Mississippi Gulf Coast. It did not hit New Orleans. What happened in New Orleans, what happened to those poor folks who were stranded in the city, that kind of thing had a lot to do with moral evil. It had a lot to do with people shirking their responsibilities with the levees, cutting corners, and had political corruption. These people were victimized. And what, what it did for me is I realized that I was looking at footage of neighborhoods that I would speed through because I was afraid before. And now here are these people, real lives, real mothers, grandmothers, grandfathers, children, and they're all suffering. What had I ever done to help alleviate that suffering in advance? Not enough, right? So then you also, of course, have the extraordinary paradox that you would never have love in the sense that we've described it already, if you did not have the, the freedom to do precisely the kind of horrifying evils that you're talking about. Um, and that's the extraordinary thing about moral evil, is that from every perspective, God, who is the cause of all things, is the cause of everything that leads up to it. But the whole that we carve in that the horrifying abyss that we make in it is the only thing that we can ultimately take individual soul responsibility for, right? Because evil is when we deprive goodness where goodness ought to be, right? So it's a lack of, yeah. they, they talk about evil as being a lack of something rather than right. a positive thing or a, or a real thing. And uh, So, you know, I mean, there is this kind of understanding you know, even amongst Catholics, the sort of cultural understanding that Christianity is kind of anti-pleasure, anti-sex, anti... So I'll, I'll bring up adultery as an example. I, and, and when I talk about this, I say, like, what is the evil of adultery? What is the moral evil of, of adultery? Because it's not the sexual pleasure, that's good. And it's not the desire for intimacy, that's good. All of those things. What is it? It is the lack of fidelity to a spouse that ought to be present because you committed your life to them, right? 
That's the evil of adultery. That's what's missing. What was the? It was the? Was it? Was it the 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 gases of the of the concentration camp? The gases that they used were those evil. I mean, you know, you know more chemistry than I do. They have a molecular structure. They have all these things. You know, is that? Was it the concrete walls? Was it the? Was it the 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 metal that was used in the barbed wire? Or was it the lack of compassion and the lack of respect for the dignity of those people? That's where the true evil and thought, word, and deed, right? That's where it that's where it was. That's where it resided. And that is a nothing. That's an appalling hole where a hole ought to be. So what gives us that ability, like from a Christian or Catholic perspective, right? To the, that humans are created good, right? So there's a what 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 allows that? To our, our ability to turn from that. So, people, yeah. particularly if you look at the Genesis uh, text, I mean, we say, well, yeah. God created us, and there's this, this turning away from, from, from God, right? And, and so, how do you see what, <laughs> how do you see that in terms of, yeah. of, of the, the allowing, you know, created in the state that uh, uh, from an evolutionary process, yeah. humans come onto the scene, are we, in a sense, we're vulnerable to yeah. some to the fall, right? right? You know? Well, there's this ancient and I mean, uh, sort of traditional way of understanding the fall, which of course is the actual historical sin, right? right. That yeah. brought our race to its sorry state, right? <laughs> um, when Saint Thomas Aquinas talks about it, for example, he says that the consequence of the fall is that we just revert to what we have by nature without grace. And what we have by nature is a, is a thing that, that because it's physical and because it's evolutionary, is always has a certain ambivalence to it. I mean, so why um, are we as a species so able to bond in groups the way that we do? That's a great good. I mean, we wouldn't have communities, teams, churches. We wouldn't have any of those things if human beings weren't just social animals. Right, and there's a lot in evolutionary biology. So it's the only way to understand hominid or, or, or yeah. human is to see this group competition right. going on, and that, that that helps fuel like language. You, you don't say, "How does that evolve?" Without some benefit to the group, right? right? It's you cooperation. Know, if I have language and nobody else does, it doesn't help me, right? It's, right, I, right. It's it's a group thing, right? Yeah. But we know deep in our evolutionary history, and we share it with chimps. Um, we have what's been called. Uh, a sort of an innate distrust of those who are different than we are, right? Because it's not really that we have that. That's not the, the scale is down here. The scale is, is weighed with the good. The good is we bond in groups. Right. But we can allow that the shadow side of that, the shadow that it casts, and every real good object casts a shadow, right? If you put it in the sunlight, right, right? The shadow, we can live in that, we could live for the shadow rather than this. Or we can do what we have seen both Christians and non Christians do, which is to actually see the other person as a brother or a sister and treat them as if they're part of our group, even though they seem so ethnically and racially different than us. That's what we can do. That's what reason and freedom make possible, right? So our evolutionary heritage is by itself not enough. We need grace. We need, we need moral direction. What we need, interestingly enough, is a human being to come along who lives out all of the good inclinations in a perfect way and is willing to put the love that that involved above his very biological life. And that's what we have, right? That's who Jesus Christ is. That's why we call him the new Adam, the final Adam. Because the first human being, that what we are by nature isn't enough, right? We need to be shown the way to orient it all. Otherwise, it just remains a puzzle to us. Because there's plenty of good reasons to distrust those who are outside, just knowing that they might probably distrust me too. Right. Yeah, exactly. They're dealing with the same biases or whatever yeah, yeah, that, 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 yeah. that we have. Or think about, you know, the, what do they call it? Cognitive bias. I, you know, when you teach me evolutionary biology, I listen to you and I trust you um, innately. I mean, you're a biologist. You've got a PhD in biology, and I know that you know your subject and you're speaking about it confidently. That's, a, that's an evolutionary thing, too, this, uh, this willingness to trust what you're told as true. But in cases where we could talk about Nazi ideology, remember the big parades and the speeches by Hitler and the huge monuments? 
and the way that these slogans became part of everyday life and on posters and everywhere, repeating a truth statement over and over and over again seems to make us cognitively more likely to accept it as true. Yeah. No, that's, that's good. Good. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. That's the shadow that this good thing, our willingness to trust one another, because 99% of what I know, I know because people told me. You know what I mean? That's this, this, that's the shadow. Well, we can live facing the shadow or we can live in the good. Yeah. And that's something that, you know, it's like, like on our own, we can't, no, we can't do, right? No, no, that no, was right. the point, that, that, that well, we grace, grace and grace. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and, yeah. It's like uh, Corey Ace tells people, you know, he goes, basically, uh, what, living in original sin means this human being without grace. That's what it means. That's, that's, that's the long and the short of it. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so there isn't some like, oh, you have uh, this creature that then is totally deformed after the fall, but it is, it's, it's a deprivation of, yeah. of grace, which leads to the deprivation that evil is, right. right? I mean, one of the most off, non-scriptural, quoted, quotable quotes from the history of Christianity is from St. Augustine, you have made us for ourselves, Lord, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. Well, that's just what we're saying, right? I mean, what we're saying is, God, all of what we got, from nature, all of it comes from God, and it was all about orienting us towards Christ. You know what I mean? Towards, towards this communion with God that will never end. So, you know, we've been talking about uh, evil and the, the, our capacity for it, and the, you know, some of it's written into our biology in a sense that, that yeah, it, yeah. It, it predisposes us without grace to right, right. do that. But what, what do you think that it tells about the fact that we have uh, a world in which suffering and evil are, are, are present yeah. in terms of the, what does it tell us about the purpose of human life, right? What is it, well, what are we meant for if it, it, that we are in um, a world where we're all going to experience suffering? Is, is, is that point to, again, you have to sort of be outside of the, yeah, yeah, <laughs> the yeah. system to be able to see it, but, but is there something we can glean from that? What, what does it mean to be human and what is the purpose yeah. of human life? Because I think that, the, the the people that that that, sh, uh, that that look for oh God didn't create the perfect world have it yeah. you know, could have been like this uh, could have been perfect we'd have no suffering and everybody's got everything they need there's there's something to that that they're 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 bringing in their um a, a, what they think the purpose of human life is right right you can't escape those two things go together sure. right so yeah. um oh well, yeah absolutely so um. All right, so this is one of the problems I have with um, contemporary Catholic ap apologetics sometimes, is that it tries to make it all like, you know, a QED kind of equation. You're just a fool if you don't believe in God. No, no, no. the logic of a rapacious, of a war-like lifestyle, that, that's cogent. I can put all that together that way. I can put everything I experience in myself together that way. Yeah, it's going to have its downfalls, but so will the so will the peace ethic have its downfall when the well, you know when when the barbarians arrive and start burning down my village. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Sure. Yeah, the, there's a logic to both of them. Both of them come together. Both of them seem to have their triumphs and their tragedies. Right? Um, which should I pick? And in the end, faith is free. We only find out when it's shown to us what the deepest and the best is. That love is the deepest and the best. We only, have, we only know that if, when it's shown to us. Otherwise, we love when we, when we want to love, and we don't love when we don't want to love. <laughs> Isn't that the truth? Yeah, no, no, it's not like everybody just lives hatefully. No. I mean, right. Yeah, yeah you know, I mean, even, you know, even people who horrify us end up here and there. You know what I mean? Doing something. Love their dog. Like yeah, <laughs> they love their dog or their or their kid. Right. Yeah. And their wife. You never. You know. Um, but uh, it, it was um, Alexander Solzhenitsyn said, "If only we could just point over there and say, that's where all the evil people are." He goes, "But the line between good and evil runs straight down the human art. That's that's, and we don't know which one to choose." Uh, one of my favorite stories, and I I use it in my every class that I teach. Um, is a good man is hard to find by Flannery O'Connor. And that's the point the misfit is making. You know, he said, you know, Jesus raised people from the dead and he never should have done it. Because if he did it, if I was there and I saw him do it, I would know what my life was about. But if he's not there, there's, there's no pleasure but meanness. 
And of course, he's saying this as he's as he's killing an entire family. He and his he and his uh, convict friends are killing an entire family. You know, I mean, well, there you go, right? And we can't be sentimental about about our inclinations and desires. We have to be objective about them, and the objectivity all comes from Christ. Yeah. So he had nothing. Yeah, you know, it, it seems like from from a Christian perspective, it's like you were just pointing. Out, Christ is the model. Yeah. Right. So, Everything in terms of human flourishing and what it means to be human has to be read through Christ, right? right? And 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 so in doing so, yeah. what does that? Where does that get you? Yeah, well, right. Read it through Christ. We look back on it all and we say, of course, yeah, of course. You know what I mean? This is why I, I loved my mother, or this is why I was sad when I had a quarrel with my friend, or this is you know uh, those kinds of things. We look back and we see them in that new light and we understand them. Um, uh, in a new way, um, in the deepest and the most wonderful possible way. But, you know, but we need that light in order to, you know, in your light, we see light, we say, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Now we know what was light and what was darkness. Um, and now we know what is light and what is, is, is darkness and how we think about our present and how we prepare for the future. Yeah. yeah. Well, let's give you, I, I just, we're wrapping up here. I just give you one, uh, one last question. If you had to, you know, talk to someone, would be the one thing you'd want them to take away in terms of someone that's really struggling with moral evil, right? And, right. and I, I just don't see how a loving God could, could, could be there. I mean, again, I don't think the, the reason this question is, yeah. is, is, is such an ancient one and it will continue, humans will struggle with it until the, the second sure. coming, you know, um, there's not a pat answer like, oh, here's your answer and then go away. But how, what would you what would you want them to take away to reflect upon that you think can be fruitful in terms of the uh, sure. letting them at least you know I wouldn't want them I wouldn't want them to reflect I don't think I think I would I would offer them um, an opportunity to do something right um, make God bear the burden of proof there's the 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 heart of Christianity is this idea that God has fully revealed himself to humanity, right? So in Christ, God has shown us everything about what it means to be God. What I would say is, go show God everything about what it means to be you, suffering from victimization, suffering from moral evils that have been perpetrated against you by those you love, or by those you've, you, by strangers, um, tell God how angry you are about it. Tell God you're pissed off. And if you're not sure if God exists, tell God you're angry that he doesn't exist because if he existed, you could tell him. That's what I think I would say. In fact, that's what I say all the time to people. That's what I did in Katrina. You know, um, I moved from our beautiful first home. And when I say beautiful, it was tiny. But it was beautiful to me because I brought my children home to that house for the first time. We moved from that because I was an hour and a half from work. And my wife was like, I've got a, we've got a four-year-old, five-year-old daughter and a three-year-old son, and you're always an hour and a half away. And you've got all these responsibilities, and you're getting home every night at 7, 30, 8 o'clock. Let's get closer to your work. And so we moved. And so I did a good thing. And then I got wiped out. <laughs> you know what I mean? I, got, wait, wait. I tried to do a good thing and I got wiped out. And I told God I was angry. No, I think and how he, many times have we all said that? And he showed, he's, he showed me a path. And don't put a time limit on it. If you're doing it for the rest of your life, just keep telling God that you're angry about your suffering. And then, and then just to give him five or 10 seconds and listen. Yeah. So not, not to run away from it, no. but to, 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 to enter, in, enter into that do and bring did. God into that. Right, no, if, no. if he were here, I would stand before his seat and I would tell him, yeah. that's what I think, that's what I think the answer to suffering is. Yeah, that's what I do when I suffer, Lee. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Uh, that's great advice. Uh, but, thank yeah. you. Well, Chris, thanks for uh, being here today and, and talking. And anybody that's interested in this topic, again, the book, Creation, A Catholic's Guide to um, God and the Universe. It's an excellent read. Um, I highly recommend that to everybody. Chris, always a pleasure to have you. It's yeah, always great to be here, Dan. Thank you. It was great to hear his insights on this topic. 
Yeah, yeah. He's got a lot of, uh, you know, um, the, the ways of that are useful to look at, you know, the problem of, of suffering, you know, even though it's the, it's one of those things that there's never really a definitive answer, but there, you know, there's ways that help us understand, you know, the, the, the reality of human suffering. Um, and, you know, I would recommend to anybody, you know, um, that's interested in these, these topics, his book, you know, um, Creation, a Catholic's Guide to God and the Universe, because he does, he lays out, um, you know, what, what we talked about in the interview in, in more detail here. And it's very accessible. I think it's a very useful resource for people that are thinking about this issue. That's great to know. Well, now you had questions for him. I now have questions for you as we pivot to today's office hour segment. So this first one, um, famed atheist and biologist Richard Dawkins, again, familiar name to many, he's defending on the record two biological sexes in the face of transgenderism. He is on the record as saying, in earlier uh, 2023, there are two sexes and that's all there is to it. So when you hear this, Stan, and you hear Dawkins saying this, does it mean that he is siding with a purposeful biology? I think he is really, you know, rooted in biology In um, you know, he gets a lot of the theology, I think, and philosophy wrong, but he does a good job of looking at the biology and says, you know, from a biological perspective, what is sex for? And it's for reproduction. And so you have two uh, sexes. You have the male and female. And for bio- biologically, those are the only two that make sense evolutionarily, right? So as an evolutionary biologist, he's looking at it with the the, the, the proper uh, lens and, and, and proper reason, because he's looking, what's the purpose of sex? Even though he doesn't, he might deny that there's purpose in general, he is actually trying to figure out what's the purpose of it. And yeah, you differentiate in male or female. And sure, there's intersex conditions where you don't properly differentiate, but there's no purpose or end to those biologically, you know, because they don't lead to, you know, the propagation of, of, of of the species. And that's, you know, so, so he is looking at it in, I think, a very reasonable, rational way. Well, speaking of purpose, we got this question submitted to us, which again, I think fits perfectly with our goals here. This question came in. Is concluding that there is a purpose behind or a purpose within the natural world, is that even scarier than the thought of purposelessness? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. You know, I think there's, there, there's a, a responsibility that comes with recognizing there's a purpose, right? So if I'm meant for something um, and I have a purpose, then I have a responsibility to do my best to live that out. And so if I feel like uh, there's a purpose to my life, I'm meant to be, say, you know, um, in communion with this, my spouse or with my children and my family and then with God, you know, then there's an obligation on me, right? Um, and so, and some people, that's scary to have an obligation protecting in today's society, right? But at the same time, when you think that it's purposelessness all the way down, that there is no purpose, that's also scary. And that leads, you know, you see psychologically that people that don't have a purpose uh, struggle with a lot of mental illness. They feel like there, there's no worth, there's no point to anything, right? And so I think that to me is actually scarier than you know the idea that there's purpose. Purpose does put demands on you, but we're meant to have demands on us. We're not meant to be just autonomous and sit there and enjoy our life and do whatever the heck we want, where there is this need for us to come out of ourselves. And it seems when there is that purpose, then there is hope, whereas purposelessness, you can see how you can fall easily into despair. Despair and hope, right. And so, yeah, maybe I'm not living out my purpose the way I, 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 I need to, but there's always hope that I can do better, right? And so you have that whereas if there's no purpose in it, then I have no hope that anything means anything, right? Big questions that everyone in some way or another grapples with at some point. So grateful for that question that came in. And just a reminder, if you have a question for Dan that you want to hear him answer on the podcast, you can email it in at info at com. You can also leave us a voice message. You can call 949-257-2436. But be sure always to check out MajaCenter.com for the latest updates, the latest information on the podcast, and make sure to subscribe. Until then, we'll see you next week.